Let's turn to the financial community, ladies and gentlemen, and how that market works. You get two kinds of risk. You get financial risk and business risk. Now, clearly, nobody would combine high financial risk and high business risk. That's why there's a cross there. I mean, one example is the late Sir Freddie Laker. Wonderful man. Everybody loved him. He had a bit of disaster with his airline, if you recall. He borrowed lots of money. Uh, his financial gearing was very high. He went on the busiest route in the world, which was London, New York, that one. And, of course, he needed 80% plus occupacy to break even and his financial gearing was very high and his basic strategy was low price. Now if you were British Airways or American Airlines, you wanted to get rid of Freddie Laker, what would you do? You'd drop your prices for a while, get rid of him. What did Richard Branson do? Well, he started with one plane which he leased, so his financial gearing is zero. He can take his plane back the next day if he doesn't like it. He goes on the, his financial gearing zero. He goes on the busiest route in the world, London, North Atlantic. And what's his strategy? Differentiation. Who's still there? Richard Branson. Now, I don't want to go into the rest of it other than to say that there is clearly a correlation, isn't there, ladies and gentlemen, between risk and return. Now, if you've got a high risk up here, you demand a high return. Of course you do. If, on the other hand, you say, I'm going to be very cautious and put all my money into a proper bank account where the interest rates, let's say, vary between 1.8 and 2, with no real difference, you don't mind accepting a low return because you know there's no risk. So th these are stock exchanges. You get all the shares in a market, scatter them around. You find a line of best fit, which is called the beta, and on that line is what you would normally expect by way of return in a particular sector. So if this was, say, the pharmaceutical sector, I know it's more than this, but let's say the weighted average return on investing in the pharmaceutical sector, let's say it was 10%, that's what you call the cost of capital. It's quite straightforward. It really is very, very simple, cost of capital. So I'm saying, OK, I'm going to invest in this sector. The least I'll expect is 10%. If you only make 9% for me, you're destroying shareholder value. If you make 11, you're creating shareholder value. Blinding limbs of the obvious, isn't it? Now, everybody knows that. I mean, that's not difficult. And historically, if I look back that way, historically, and I've got a company, let's keep the math simple, where I say I've got, say, 15,000 euros invested in it, the cost of capital is 10%, and I make $2,000 worth of net profit after tax, quite clearly I have created 500 euros of shareholder value. Now any fool can do the maths after the event, but the stock exchange couldn't care less about what you did last year. All they're interested in is what you're going to do over the next few years. Not next year, the next few years. They're interested in sustainability, hence sustainable competitive advantage and how you measure it. Super profits, economic value added, Stern Stewart, shoulder value added, positive net present value, they all mean the same thing. They're interested in continuous super profits over uh, at least three years. And sometimes when you've created shareholder value in one year, the capital value of the shares go down because the stock exchange knows how you've done it. They know that you've cut your costs, they know you've downsized, they know you've done, and they know it's not sustainable. And after all, ladies and gentlemen, if you think about it, how many pence are there in a pound? How many cents are there in a euro? How many cents are there in a dollar? That's finite, isn't it? There's only so many you can get out, whereas value creation, which is what marketers are there for, is infinite and is only limited by our creativity and imagination. And that, of course, is why CRM systems in the main don't work. The best companies in the world make them work because they manage them, they use it to get uh, transaction costs down, but they also use it to get customer value up. And that's a trick that not many companies know. So if in any one year, let's say 10%, you are making 10%, you are what you could call mediocre. Average. You're neither creating nor destroying shareholder value. Who would want to work for a company like that? You could have your marketing department make some t-shirts for you with a slogan on it saying, the good thing about being mediocre is you're always at your best. How about that? 
How about getting your sales force up at five o'clock in the morning to go and say, go, we're really mediocre, come on, let's go for it. You wouldn't, would you? You'd want to work for a company that's actually creating shareholder value. So this particular module is about what you've got to do to create shareholder value. Now there was a module which some of you might or might not have seen on strategic marketing planning and putting a strategic marketing plan together which is world class is actually about creating shareholder value continuously and this particular module is about how you go about actually measuring whether you are